you questions. Uh, first, the student participants, please. <coughs> yes. Uh, we were wondering, uh, first of all, thank you for your uh, lecture. It was very interesting and also very new for me in terms of what I learned. Um, are there any factors or aspects known about the society that sort of explain or can serve to explain the uh, seemingly exceptional uh, rate of conversion or fervor of religious conversion in Tlaxcala compared to other regions in Spain? <laughs> and also, uh, a personal uh, or the personal interest, uh, which kind of uh, role did religion play in the conflicts? Local, uh, local conflicts before or after the uh, colonial arrivals. Mm -hmm. Maybe if that is a factor. Yeah. yeah thanks for the, for the the great questions. Um, I will start with the with the first part. Um, and I think uh, really the, the example of Tlaxcala here. Um, I mean because I think for me we can with Tlaxcala we can. I would say we can distinguish here yeah, between really the kind of the what we know that there were definitely factors of special uh, Christian influences and so on, and but also then really this this important construction of of this religiosity. Yeah, that I could just uh, touch on it uh, now a bit. Um, so so kind of these two come together. Um, but I mean we know that for sure, for example, the the Spanish here yeah, again the, the, for them it was the special. Ally, um, there was really early on, yeah, there was a bishopric in, in Tlaxcala actually that was, I think, uh, quite early that, that uh, came over, was, was established uh, there. Um, one of the first ones. And, um, also, for example, the Franciscans, yeah, who established kind of, kind of a base. So we, maybe we could say, yeah, the Franciscans who were also the first religious order who mm. was called over kind of by, by Cort yeah, Cortes, uh, who, who had a hand. In this, um, and so they, they of course had a really important impact in in this region. Yeah? Not only in this region, for example, also to uh, in, uh, in Mexico City, close to Mexico City, the Franciscans, uh, for example, they established one uh, colegio, one, one college, maybe we could say, uh, like Telolco, yeah, of where they would teach uh, kind of now elites of that region. Um, but so they were they were definitely in many various regions, but Tlaxcala was an important one for for the Franciscans. Um, yeah, so there there are definitely um, this kind of this historic roots to it. Um, but again, yeah, the, this construction, and I mean, I, I showed some things more from maybe the, the 16th century, yeah, where we can see this taking shape um, already, uh, kind of the early conversion, yeah. And, <laughs> and, uh, and we know, yeah, that for example, these conversions that they're always they are cited also by other authors yeah, from other Nawa groups. Their ancestors converted early on. I mean, uh, we know, yeah, that for example, uh, with the Franciscans, there would have been this kind of this mass conversions actually of, of larger groups. Yeah, this is uh, <laughs> this was really important to the, to the Spanish. Yeah, this mission to to convert, and uh, this was. Of course, was really central yeah, to to kind of to the legitis legitimization of of rule. Um, so yeah, I mean, and then we can we can think of this uh, this mass conversions. Of course, they would surely not have been uh, really um, um, uh, the, not been really voluntary in, <laughs> in these cases. Um, but yeah, so so construction taking place at that time and. Then we also have uh, really like some interesting examples later on. Yeah, I'm, I just have now this one case. Yeah, one author from the 18th century who's uh, really still taking up these uh, different narratives. Um, and uh, another part now, I, I, which I had to leave out of, about it now. But uh, there are definitely like these uh, stories here yeah, that are being told or retold by. Uh, for example, Tlaxcala, uh, authors from Tlaxcala and also um, different other authors, yeah, also like Creole authors in the 18th century, people of European descent. Um, and so these would be like stories about, uh, yeah, this, uh, this apparitions, yeah, the apparition of a, of a virgin figure. Yeah, that's the Virgin of Guadalupe, yes, the, the most uh, well known, really important one in, in Mexico. But there was also one of, uh, or got land, so and one tied to 
to Tlaxcala as well. Mm -hmm. um, there's also then there's another story quite influential of kind of this the child martyrs of of Tlaxcala. Yeah, this is this was also and uh, <coughs> actually it goes back to the to the 16th century a Franciscan priest apparently I think Matulania priest who who told the story and was kind of of course this idea of uh, Franciscans to to use these stories to show how successful they are in in um, converting and uh, this child martyrs yeah this is taken up and even also in the in the 18th century later on um, so I <laughs> kind of I went in in some different directions but uh, this was kind of to to your your question for Dashkala I hope that <laughs> it answered a bit um, and but uh, now I think it it also went a bit in your with your second question but maybe or could you just uh, Repeat again. Um, now, this, uh, the second question was more about uh, mm -hmm. uh, general knowledge. I don't really know much about the region. Uh, what kind of region, uh, uh, what kind of role religion played before mm -hmm. the arrival of the Spaniards? Is there any about it, or if it, what kind of role it maybe served uh, uh, in local conflicts and uh, so on and so forth? Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, thanks. Yeah. Um, I think I will um, kind of stick to the more to this part about local or conflicts and, and religion, yeah, because the role of religion. I mean, I I went a bit now into the, some different aspects of cosmology, but I think this would be would uh, lead to kind of a, a bit of field. Or it's, it's just a very big topic. Um, but I mean, yeah, for sure. So uh, we do know, yeah, there's uh, various um, and yeah. Again, we we kind of we have to be always. Bit careful again. Yeah, the, the sources, of course, are not from uh, since they're not from pre-Hispanic times. Those, there's actually big discussions here about different deities which were important. But um, but for sure, yeah, that uh, these various Altepet, the states that usually had kind of their own uh, major deity. I think this is probably quite quite clear. And uh, also this tied to this migration stories. Yeah, they would bring uh, like. Um, one author, for example, I've studied is from uh, another region of Chalco, is an author called Chumal Bahin, and he describes these various migrations, and uh, he says they had kind of their own de deity, kind of uh, mm -hmm. as, a, as a figure, yeah, to bring with them, which was really uh, central. Um, and so, yeah, and so this could also kind of tie in maybe with, with conflicts, yeah, that um, one, one good example here maybe would be a would again be with the, the Mexica, yeah, the, the, with Tenochtitlan, and apparently they would have actually brought, yeah, the, kind of uh, had this a bit this wider vision. They had their own uh, major deity, but they would also bring in different statues of people that they, uh, who, who state they had kind of conquered, um, and bring these statues into their own capital, yeah, this kind of a bit more pantheistic maybe <laughs> perspective. Um, so, yeah, I would say this. Uh, one aspect uh, of it. <laughs> Thank you. And now um, everyone is invited to address uh, questions to the speaker. Thank you. Then Eleonora, please. Thanks. Um, yeah. Thank you for this for this presentation and um, fascinating insight into um, Navajo culture. Um, with regard to our interest here in um, in the. Uh, concept of momentum of its own. I was thinking, I mean, obviously it was striking to see the, the coat of arms while we were just talking about coats of arms before, but on mm -hmm. the other hand, we have to keep in mind that, um, as you were saying, the unfortunate thing is we don't have a lot of rec actual records from Nahua people from before colonial contact. And this is uh, definitely a co colonial era mm -hmm. sort of production, which to my mind means that Nahua intellectuals have, or, or the Nahua elite um, who was writing or painting glyphs was, had learned um, very well how to use European symbols and European kind of forms of, of narrative representation mm -hmm. to state their aims mm -hmm. and um, as the title of your presentation suggests to sort of also yeah kind of put mm -hmm. forward their claims so um, and of course now that the evil question is or would be like do we have any inkling of, of whether anything similar um, was going on before European contact 
because otherwise, I mean, that is, it's, a, it's, it, what we are seeing is, is really a, an, an inability of uh, a conquered people to speak the language of the conqueror, basically, mm-hmm. um, which is an interesting thing in itself. Um, but maybe what we could expect to happen, and also maybe not what we want to find out with our with our concept. Um, and on the other hand, what I find interesting is what you were saying as well about the marriage practices. And so many um, Spaniards married um, Nahua noble women, and I have no clue, but maybe the experts here do. Um, are there studies on whether these women um, had? were able to to then kind of influence Spanish colonial culture um, with with their sort of um, indigenous native background. Like, do we see any maybe not so visible on the surface transformations of Spanish colonial society by these um, yeah marriages relations um, and by these especially women? Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. Interesting questions. Um, yeah, maybe I will start with the second one and try try to come to, to the first one after. Um, yeah, so this this intermarriages. Yeah, there's definitely there's been some really some some interesting research into it. And um, um, yeah, I think just before the, <laughs> we started, also you were talking a bit about these topics um, and. I mean, it's always, yeah, that even I think, yeah, the terms are really, really complicated yeah, because, I mean, as I said, it's uh, especially then early on, yeah, early 16th century, we, usually it's mentioned as the kind of these forced, forced marriages or forced uh, relationships. And then there's always kind of this question, yeah, in, in some way, you know, there's the argument maybe uh, native families could have uh, seen this as a, as a way to, to use, uh, to, to gain more influence or to, to have a kind of a strategic advantage in that. But yeah, on the other hand, it's of, of course, yeah, it's, there's always this, this kind of forced element, at least yeah, earlier on. Um, and then I would say definitely we do have kind of this more, uh, this more kind of uh, a mixed uh, in at least at the elite levels here yeah, that's it's quite important also I mean and I should add here yet for example there's there's been some interesting studies regarding law yes yeah, so and uh, yeah so Susan Kellogg for example she, she's written quite a bit about this and also saying how we yeah, are basically probably in pre-hispanic times that uh, women who would still have had kind of more rights uh, before before this this different court systems and could speak, uh, could kind of uh, litigate, litigate, um, and this was then not possible anymore in the colonial era. Um, uh, definitely, there's kind of this um, kind of some decrease of the agency in some sense. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I talked a little bit about this. The um, this uh, two uh, two ladies, uh, Doña Isabel, Doña Leonor, yeah, of uh, highest ranking, kind of. Uh, Daughters of, of Moctezuma the, the second, um, who could really uh, did have quite uh, the influence. They held these two really large uh, encomiendas. Yeah, it was quite mm-hmm. quite exceptional. Um, and then it was always yeah the, their husbands, their Spanish husbands, who represented them before court. Um, but I mean, there's yeah then there's kind of this implicitly uh, the, the influence, the, the agency of of these noble women is there. Um, and yeah, but again, always to kind of to distinguish them between this noble, uh, this elite level and uh, other mm-hmm. other levels. Um, um, and this, yeah, there's, uh, I mean, and, uh, there's a study on, on these uh, descendants of Moctezuma, I think it's by Donald uh, Chipman, yeah, so who's written about this. And um, um, yeah, well, I'll just think a bit about it, but mm-hmm. also now that there's, uh, also this is quite a more recent one, I think it's uh, by Lisa Sosa as well, and, and, and you know, I can, maybe I can give you a bit of reference also uh, later on or so, but uh, this is it's a bit more recent and she's uh, actually, I think it's the first monograph that really focuses more on specifically on native women's influence yeah this is i think it's still been quite uh, quite um, yeah under researched and unfortunately um and yeah and she's she's saying also that if we kind of move a bit away from these more 
elite level that there would have been also still agency of of, uh, of native women. Uh, she talks about different uh, population, uh, different native groups, um, and yeah, for example, in, in the households, of course, but in trade also, and also she mentions kind of uh, resistance, yeah, that is being in more rural areas that is being organized uh, by women uh, as well. Um, and yeah, so and uh, I'm also I kind of I started or I've sort of finished working about an article that talks about some of these these topics. Yeah, so I'm really really interested. Looking forward to it. Please, oh. please do share. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now I, I always get a bit sidetracked, but I think because your first question was kind of this really larger one and about it was more like a comment a comment as well. Sure. I think in many ways, so it was about the coat of arms and and mm. the. the um, the Nahua more sort of this showing more that they they learned how to mm -hmm. use European ways mm -hmm. of expressing themselves. Yeah. That's okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think there are more questions. The next is Kion Valmaya. <clears throat> uh, thank you for your talk, too. And uh, I have a question regarding the hierarchy of the elites, of the uh, elites you mentioned. Um, <coughs> Well, I, I think uh, from what I uh, gathered from your talk um, that the um, slash kind of elites had a hierarchy uh, under themselves. So there were higher ranking elites and lower ranking elites. Mm -hmm. And uh, what uh, interests me is how did they measure the ranking of the elites? So I'm a historian of medieval Europe and uh, higher and lower ranking elites were several uh, measurements like lineage uh, was uh, of one uh, closeness to the ruler was one mm. so um, i think think lineage seemed to play an important role uh, in from the mm. too uh, and closeness um, when i look at the um, the codex you showed um, there were these uh, slash Callens who were bringing tribute to the coat of arms of the uh, spanish ruler and um, when I looked at it from the perspective of a medieval, uh, of a historian of medieval Europe, I thought so. Maybe the elites who were the first in line um, with their tribute, they were the higher-ranking ones because they were closer mm. to the coat of arms of the uh, of the Spanish ruler. Mm -hmm. Something along that line. Mm -hmm. so maybe you can elaborate on the uh, the, the ranking of the elites. Mm. Sure. Yeah. Th thanks for the question and. Actually, it, it reminds me. I, I we, we talked about it just just now. Yeah, I, I actually I completely forgot about the the lens or the Tlaxcala. Actually, to mention that it was kind of this really this larger structure about two uh, uh, and five meters. Yeah, and was used as a, as a tapestry. Yeah, it could be uh, hung on a on a wall. Yeah, so this representation <coughs> factor also definitely already uh, played played in there. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, lineages, the, the ranking of elites, I mean, definitely lineages really do take pl take a special importance. Um, this, no, I just uh, showed a bit about it with the, the Lienzo and the idea is that kind of if you uh, try, uh, remember a little bit, the, really you have kind of these larger figures and then all around are the kind of these really small, uh, really small figures uh, for each of the four parts um, and one, at least one, Hypothesis is that each of them would represent one of the lineages of, of the four parts who had actually then their own influence as well. Uh, so yeah, so really quite complex. At, again, at least with with uh, Tlaxcala. Um, and so I mean, and I think this, this uh, brings me a bit back to the to the last question as well. That uh, yeah, again, this intermarriages. Yeah, that uh, I discussed a bit now for this earlier earlier colonial times. Um, <laughs> But there's also definitely there's some research talking about it, the importance of kind of, yeah, we could say like marriage alliances, maybe yeah, for, for before the Europeans arrived. This is uh, quite, quite, quite some uh, writings on that. Yeah, that really kind of the Mexica is this, as I mentioned, yes, was kind of uh, this federation, but the, their power, they were still expanding yeah, at that, that point, um, early 16th century. And uh, there's also some ideas. Yeah, I think uh, Navarra Telinares, yeah, the Mexican historian, yeah, he's, he's talked also about this, saying that really they were still trying more and more, kind of to kind of bring uh, high-ranking 
daughters of, of the rulers of Mexica rulers and to marry them in other states, yeah, to to expand actually their influence in this way, yeah, not not just by warfare. And I mean, this all, all also for me at least it kind of <laughs> there's definitely some reminder yeah, or some some parallels with <laughs> with Europe at, at that time. Um, yeah, so but this is the Mexican example, but Mexica, but also with with other states, definitely. Yeah, so this kind of uh, dynastic, if we want. Um, uh, connections that are that are really important um and yeah and i mean this is i mean just i think just uh, briefly here but with the because you talked about ranking and high elites then lower forms of elites i mean this is definitely it's quite quite complicated for us now to to know how this came about exactly there were uh, probably there were different forms of maybe electing uh, rulers uh, sometimes it could be the highest born son, sometimes it could be an uncle, there could be elections, at least for the Mexica as well. Um, uh, this is quite probable as well. Um, but, but yeah, there was uh, also, I mean, again, and this is again uh, talking about colonial era sources, yeah, because I was talking a bit about this 17th uh, century chronicler, Chimay Pahinda, who I've worked on there and he, he kind of he really makes quite a strong distinction there yeah, he's really very interested in the higher the rulers yeah the and their own descendants <coughs> in colonial times and then the elites they're also like the nobles uh, they're still important and after that uh, the, the commoners this is he talks really much less about it so it seems really that this is something that must have been very very important and it's still carried on um yeah i hope that <laughs> answered some of your questions. Okay, uh, Pascal Fildes. Yes, um, yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, uh, so one theme of the conference is, is uh, uh, about uh, the consensus orientation. Mm -hmm. And uh, you uh, presented a, a very nice example <laughs> in a way uh, uh, with this uh, um, Plax, uh, uh, um, uh, this Pascal, uh, a taken perspective, which like uh, where you where you also mentioned, you know, uh, you, you said it yourself. You, this, so so we have one uh, on the one hand we have this like self representation and this historiography, which is well consensus oriented oriented in some way, uh, uh, representing uh, them as as, as uh, uh, loyal uh, allies of the Spanish. Um, and on the other hand, you uh, you mentioned well. Of course, there's all this conflict and this uh, demographic uh, catastrophe going on at the same time. Um, and I was wondering, um, um, uh, are there also um, historiographical uh, traditions uh, from uh, like the same time or or, or later um, that are more critical about the role of the. Uh, uh, Tlaxcal takes uh, in the uh, in the whole uh, um, conquest and and uh, and their well their alliance with the Spaniards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it's <laughs> so it's a very very good question, and I mean yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, I have to to think a bit about it. Um, but I mean this is uh, this kind of this ties in a bit. With this, uh, what I've been mentioning a bit before, yeah, that you know, kind of I've tried to focus more now on, on the, the case here, Tlaxcala, but um, there are really, there's kind of also these various traditions of, of in our history writing and the colonial times in, in different other areas. Um, there are like uh, Munoz Camargo, Tlaxcala, very important, well known author. There, at the same time, there would have been. Uh, authors, for example, in, in uh, Mexico City, as well, someone of uh, Mexica descent is, um, uh, for example, writing, or for people from from the Acoloa, yeah, from from another group, um, as well. And so, yeah, this again, some of the the scholars that I've studied, and there, it's usually really yeah, kind of the the Tlash Calteca. This is the, they could be seen as uh, kind of as the bad guys, yeah, as the <laughs> kind of the the friend of the enemy, maybe, but um, yeah, it's it's not, maybe not exactly that. Um, but the kind of their own enemy. Um, so uh, so one of these authors is um, 
ist äh, Fernando de Alva, ich stehe schon schild, I mentioned a bit, uh, he's uh, from the 17th century, descended from the Akolua rulers, so the Akolua who had been allies with the with the Mexica and then part of the Akolua who sided with the with the Spanish as well. Um, and he's also, he's actually then really talking quite a bit about this and saying, yeah, the uh, Tlaxcala, they, this, he's actually probably, he's doing also some form of construction there because he's kind of painting them as the, the, the people who are coming into Tenochtitlan when, when it's was being conquered and who are really, you know, burning buildings or doing this horrible violence and, and more actually than, than the Spanish. Yeah. So it's, it's, mm -hmm. and again, I mean, if we, if we turn it back a bit, this, the, his, from this perspective here yeah, that for someone from this other group, that Tlaxcala would have been more kind of yeah. this, this, this enemy from this perspective. Yeah. He, this Fernando de Alva, he was writing more for a Spanish audience and he's saying my own ancestors, they were really, important as well they, they had an important role in this in these wars they are not being really uh, rewarded as much as Tlaxcala for example yeah and so this uh, is a bit from this perspective um so yeah I mean this, this is one example but I think just Tlaxcala would be one but there's also between as I said this kind of this idea of the uh, micro ethnicity micro patriotism yeah different scholars where then there's also really various of these Chronicles were kind of quite have this bias against the Mexica, yeah, because the Mexica as well <laughs> had been rulers. They had uh, really succeeded to have uh, really special rights as well. So it goes back to, yeah, kind of pre-Hispanic rivalries probably, but it's even uh, these these rights in, in the colonial times. There are two names on my list left: Valeria and Franz. Please. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I just want to go back to the um, the merits in motion part, and then also to your interest in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit more about how the privileges and the exemptions that the Flexcala gain uh, change over time, and why there is this need to reaffirm um, the special bond or the relationship um, that you mentioned? Because I recall um, Servando de Mier uh, in the 19th century, early 19th century during the revolution, he writes this famous letter reminding the Spaniards that the Tlaxcala actually helped in the conquest. So what happens to the privileges that we get to this point where, where this has to happen? Mm -hmm. So um, I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about change over time mm -hmm. with regards to the relationship between the Tlaxcala and the Spaniards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, actually, I... Maybe this is something I, I probably I have to think about a bit more for for myself actually. Yes, yeah, so I think I, I can't really completely uh, give you, give you an answer here now. Um, but I mean, yeah, I mean I have to think about it a bit. But I mean, there's also kind of this bit of a larger argument if we're thinking about the, the 18th century. Yeah, this I mean, and I've, as I mentioned, for me, uh, my focus has really been so far has been more 16th, 17th century as well. Um, but, uh, uh, for example, I, I mean, um, Peter Vieja, yeah, he, he wrote a really nice book on native elites, Creole elites and the, the, the connections between them. Yeah. How uh, there's in, this important influence between native, these native scholars who would influence Creole, uh, scholars of, of people of European descent. Um, and so, Yeah, he, he talks also about this idea that towards the 18th century, maybe there's kind of, uh, uh, there's more this idea of uh, uh, indigenous elites, maybe to kind of to reaffirm the, the, the themselves or to reaffirm also their own, uh, their own histories as well. Um, so, um, I mean, I, I alluded a bit to this, yeah, this towards the 17th century kind of uh, uh, different areas, there would have been this loss of incremental loss maybe of, of political power of, of elites, especially of the families of, of the former rulers. Yeah, this is, this, is, uh, this is quite often highlighted, yeah, that kind of the, uh, the for example, this post, yeah, I mentioned the city councils, there's this post of the, the governor, governador, and early on the idea was this was just for the descendants yeah, of the of the Tlatoke, and then uh, it, uh, this uh, would, would uh, change, yeah, that what was not always the case anymore um and so yeah kind of 18th century kind of to, to reaffirm again and to, to um 
to maybe to to um, yeah to to kind of to reform their own uh, identities in some ways and also. Um, I mean, VA, I, it's, it's a bit, it's, a, it's been a little while yeah, since, since I read it. It's a really fantastic book, but he, he also talks then about really, he traces these judicial uh, changes as well, yeah, and kind of to saying, I mean, this, this fluctuates really a lot, yeah, but even in, like in the uh, 16th century, there could have been uh, rights that were given, and then, but towards the later 16th century, mm -hmm. the Spanish control was maybe stronger, and that, uh, rights would be like taken away or you know that um, um, and even I mean an example would be also that for example the, this higher elites here and at some point they could not uh, enter anymore and, and you know higher what we would call now higher education yeah and the, the first university in Mexico Mexico City and was open for Creoles Spaniards and not for the, the native uh, people yeah so this different forms of discrimination and I mean, then, yeah, it's, uh, so this is always kind of this, this shifting. And then I think we can kind of make connections here between when uh, missions are, are being sent or it's maybe seen that, okay, we, we should, we should uh, try to, to influence in some, in some way. Um, so, yeah, so I would say this is kind of, it's definitely part of this. And the other one uh, that I just, I wanted maybe to touch on <laughs> briefly here on this, but this is also, I mean, because, for example, Vieira, yeah, who talks about it, and some others have written kind of on this exchange then with uh, indigenous scholars and the um, important Creole scholars already in the 17th century, then to the 18th century. And so, yeah, so there would have been also this exchange, like the, the last um, poem that, that I showed here, this uh, Sanchez y Salazar, and this is apparently this is someone yeah, who had really also... Uh, who, who was tied to to um, to the church and who had contact with with Creole scholars and so there was this uh, really this exchange and this the idea then that there's kind of a form of Creole patriotism maybe yeah, it's a, a bit a compli uh, a bit problematic term in some sense but uh, yeah, not to nationalism but patriotism and this could argument could be could be made um, which kind of builds on elements of this native scholarship and to highlight the importance of pre uh, culture yeah, of, of this region. But these Creole scholars, yeah, of course, they are not, <laughs> they're not descended from, from this, um, from this pre hispanic rulers. And usually they don't have really, uh, really any interest in mm. indigenous peoples yeah, in, in their own time. Yeah. So this is a different uh, scholarship on this as well. So, yeah, so some, some aspects, I, I hope that <laughs> answered some of it. Okay, last question. Well, thank you very much again for your talk. And some things were already popped up. I just want to refer to your question when you talked about or refer to content orientation, which was common, I would say, during your lecture. Also, you didn't mention it explicitly. Mm -hmm. And the source you presented two, uh, five versus two meters. If I understood you right. That's mm -hmm. like PowerPoint presentation during an audience to with the king, I would say. So there's a lot of presentism uh, in there. Hmm. And my question is just a follow-up to your question, actually. What changed over time? That, that's more or less an essential uh, theme of, of, our, um, uh, of our talk and of our conference. And you, you just, if I may just repeat one phrase, always this kind of shifting. There was always this kind of shifting. And that's precisely uh, the central theme. There's always this kind of shifting. Mm -hmm. And the kind of shifting, if I may, and that transforms the question, that leads to the elite taking up um, the effort to travel to Spain with this great PowerPoint presentation to, to, to visit the king mm -hmm. and to do what? Of course, uh, to, uh, to counter, that's my imagination now and my question, uh, um, to contradict maybe endangered positions. It, of course, it's about law and about privilege, but privilege more or less in a way is is what you need if you want to hold your position. So if it's about privilege or law behind that, I would say, is getting, gaining or, or having a fear of losing your position or gaining uh, a position you want to have. Mm -hmm. So the question would be, um, that is the first question, what changed here in a way is maybe before the, the, the embassy, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, was a kind of, as you said, kind of shifting 
uh, in the position uh, which led to to an effort to either secure a position they hold it or or to to a betterment of the position, the position they want to take mm -hmm. in the future, <laughs> which was precisely the driving motor of self-propelled dynamism. Because we can imagine that if they have the money uh, five years later, they maybe should have sent another. Uh, mission to the king because uh, still, you know, as you said, kind of shifting is still going on mm -hmm. of position, not only of laws and privileges, mm -hmm. but laws and privileges being the basis of a position you have to hold and you want to hold and you need privileges for that. Uh, that would be the, the one question and, and the most important question. Uh, maybe you can stick to that. And the second question goes on to what you said. Um, maybe they have to learn how to use code of arms and fabric code of arms themselves. And that changes. That is innovative, even if, those, if it merges maybe different um, um, different aesthetics, you know, uh, indigenous aesthetics with, with, with that of the conqueror. Uh, but do they really have to learn how to deal with powers that we will call king? And, and like the relationship between aristocrats in our term and king, which is a certain relationship, and you should you know how to deal with them. For instance, writing them poems in a way, or telling them how nice they are and how nice I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so please give mm -hmm. me my privilege and give me my position. Mm -hmm. So these these are the two questions. Okay. Uh, yeah. The first so is about change. It's about change and position. And sure. And I mean, the second one I understood it more about. Um, um, could you try to, to put it in the Well, maybe you just answer the first one. I mean, uh, about change and whether it is uh, about yeah. reclaiming position. That is the driving force behind the sure. uh, setting sail to, to Spain. Which yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks for the questions. Um, I mean, for me, basically, uh, I, I, I think yeah, I, I can't give, uh, you know, like, this direct answer it was like this <laughs> with the with 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 this topic at least um i mean i can for me like a few things uh, that came up that come up um what also things that i maybe that i haven't mentioned uh, really so far um so because also i mean well, with the, with the last question as well i mean I, I talked about kind of these shifts taking place um then i i talked more here about the relation with the Towards the, the Spanish crown, the, the, the colonial administration, um, but I mean as well there then there are other factors coming into play. Uh, yeah, I talked a bit about the religious orders as well. Um, the, yeah, the Franciscans, for example, had really <coughs> important influence, but um, <coughs> but also I mean towards maybe the later 16th century they did lose uh, quite some influence. There were the, this, tied to different <laughs> councils of, of the church uh, then in Europe again and so on. Um, so they are then the influence of the church as well and um, in, in Mexico. So I think, I mean, there are, there are also these, these, uh, these other actors here that I mm -hmm. couldn't really uh, touch upon so, so much here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, religious actors and then the, the laws here, yeah, the, the judicial uh, background that I've uh, touched on as well. Also, and I mean, I, this is maybe the other point that I would, I would like to stress as well, because I mean, I, I mentioned it kind of a little bit before, but um, I think it is definitely important. Yeah, the, if we talk, think about in terms of you know demography and this, because we, yeah, we, I talked here about like this different shifts on laws and so on, but. I mean, we do have to yeah, think about it as kind of the, this larger catastrophe, yeah, and these are kind of these elites of Tlaxcala of different other states, yeah, who, uh, who kind of they're really um, seeing the effects of massive uh, epidemics, maybe more of the, the, the larger population, sometimes of definitely for sure of, uh, elites uh, as well, yeah, and so, and then the uh, what I mentioned as well, yeah, this kind of destruction and this loss of, of sources as well, of course, yeah. So I think these are also really these different factors that, that come into play as well, yeah. And this is this is actually something that for me that I've what I've been um, working on before, which is with some of these uh, Nawa scholars as well, they actually they talk about it, yeah, they say it themselves mm -hmm. as well in some 
some ways. Uh, <laughs> as, um, Domingo Chimalpain, for example, I mentioned, and he's talking about this thing, really this kind of this loss of, of the history of his, his own state. Yeah, this is uh, it's really this large danger here. Um, and he's talking really about this importance of writing in order to keep keep the, the history alive or the, the culture of his own uh, state uh, to keep it from, from destruction. Um, so, I mean, I'm mentioning that because kind of this fact of demography and also, I mean, because I've like I've, my focus here has been more on this kind of this rights and uh, law and uh, privileges and so on. But I do think there's there's more to to this history writing, yeah. And also with Clash Kala, yeah, like someone like Munoz Camargo, there's definitely this larger interest of kind of um, yeah this um, recording this history and in order so that it won't get lost and. We know, like in some cases, yeah, some of these scholars that I just mentioned, kind of this is these are like our only or really are the some of the few sources that we have on some of these specific states. Yeah, so this was was actually very <laughs> important this this work. So yeah, thank you very much. Sure. Mm -hmm. Then let me thank everyone who contributed to this evening's lecture, the speaker, to his cousins, the assistants, and the presenters. Um, tomorrow morning, we will start our conference program here at 9 o'clock at the same place. Uh, Alla invited to continue the conversation about change and momentum of its own in pre-modern Latin America. And now all speakers are invited to dinner at Gasthof Bildmannshof. Um, we are also welcome other participants and listeners, of course. And at last, a good evening to all. Thank you.